Hi, welcome. Anton Creel here from the Institute of Trading and Portfolio Management. I'm here in London today with our newest addition to the Institute, Senior Trading Mentor, Ben Berg-Green. Ben's just flown in from Los Angeles where he's a professional trader and still trades every day. Welcome, Ben. Yeah, thanks. How are you doing? Yeah, great. It's good to be How here. How was the flight? It's a bit long, but I uh, survived. Cool. So yeah, it's, uh, I haven't been in London for uh, 15 years, so it's been a while. 15 years? Since I was here wow. last time. But, uh, cool. Yeah, it's, uh, looks, Skyline looks the same. It still looks the same, yeah? <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure it's changed a lot, but uh, it looks the same to me. So Canary Wharf was obviously there in 2001, but there was yeah. not many people there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So where, where were you based when you were in London? I was at, uh, in uh, Sloan Square. Okay. I used to work for a hedge fund there. <clears throat> It's in Chelsea, um, okay. and I was there for a few years. It was a quant, long, short, US equity quant fund that I worked for in, uh, uh-huh. back in 2001. Okay. So uh, in terms of career, you were elsewhere before London. How has the career progressed from the very beginning as a professional trader? Yeah, so my career actually started uh, in aviation. Uh, I used to be a cargo pilot flying yeah. planes in the Caribbean. And my, actually, my background, my education is in aeronautical science. So yeah. I came from a different aspect than most other traders, I think. Um, back in the mid-90s, I found myself wanting to explore other avenues. And I was really getting interested in trading and finance. I don't know where it came from, honestly. It just kind of came to me. Um, and kind of to make a long story short, I ended up working for Franklin Templeton, which is a you know, $200 billion fund. Yeah. Uh, in Fort Lauderdale as a global long only asset manager. And um, when I started there, I started in operations because I didn't really know anything about business at all. Mm. And I kind of worked my way up to the trading desk um, within the year and uh, ended up trading European assets for them for a couple of years before I moved on. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely, uh, definitely a good experience. You know, it was a great place to uh, start your your trading career from, mm. I think, learned a lot there. So you had all that infrastructure around you starting at the $200 billion fund. What did you do afterwards? When, did you came to, when you came to London, you were working more on the hedge fund side, right? Right, so I worked for a couple of the firms in between, but you know, after, uh, after 9-11 and the terrorist attack, the firm that I currently was working for got shut down. Right. Um, you know, nobody was hiring, everything was basically closed. Um, so I got an opportunity to work for a hedge fund. It was a startup fund here in, uh, in London. And I, by then I had uh, developed a lot of experience trading other asset classes, mm. which was uh, interesting for this fund. Plus that they were, since they were quantitative, used a lot of um, mathematic you know, formulas mm. and um, computer programming and all that kind mm. of stuff. So. And I had that background as well, um, you know, and it was a very sciencey type of fun mm. using chaos mathematics and uh, stuff that I was interested in. And I, so I came over here to set up their trading operation um, and uh, basically managed the fun for them, um, which I did starting in, in 2001. So that's when I lived in, in Chelsea, actually. So the name, of that fun, the name of the fund in London? It was called Head Capital. Head, okay. So obviously you went from Templeton, the big infrastructure to the hedge fund in London, more quant based, more short term, more mathematical. And then what did you do after that? Yeah, so, you know, after the, after the hedge fund, um, you know, eventually that ended up being shut down because the, the, the backers, you know, they, they, wasn't, they weren't really into hedge funds, they were actually into real estate. And they kind of figured, well, let's start a hedge fund because that sounds cool. <laughs> right. But they didn't have the, the knowledge that you really need to raise assets. Mm. So you can have great performance, but if you don't have the network and the infrastructure, you're yeah. never going to be able to get beyond your friends and family you know, yeah. asset size. So you can get up yeah, yeah. to you know, 40, 50 million, uh-huh. uh, you know, getting close to 100 million, but after that, you hit a wall. Yeah. And you really need to get assets from the big allocators. Mm which you're not going to get unless you're, you know, George Soros or Steve Cohen. 
So, so eventually that got shut down. I went back to the States. Um, you know, I was trading futures. And eventually I got the opportunity to work for G Asset Management okay. in Connecticut and basically uh, trade their whole Asian. It was actually me and another guy trading the whole Asia, Asia region. Um, so we would trade in everything from, you know, Australia open um, in like in, you know, two, three in the afternoon until in India. Right. Which uh, <clears throat> went on until 6 a.m. in the morning. Jeez. And um, we traded, that was GE's full pension fund. So that was like $250 billion. Mm. And, uh, you know, I covered Asian region for them. Cool. Went from there to, uh, to the West Coast. You know, there was a couple of reasons. Uh, one was the hours. It was a lot easier to trade Asia on the West Coast. Um, and it was also a lifestyle move for me because at that point in my career, I felt like, you know, I wanted to be where I wanted to be because of my lifestyle, not because where I, where mm. I was working. Mm. And I got a great opportunity to uh, basically run this company's Asian desk, mm. um, which I did for uh, seven years, covering the whole region that? again. That was Tradewinds Global. Trade wins. Okay. Yeah. That was uh, Naveen, Naveen Investments is a big uh, mutual fund in uh, Chicago right. that has a bunch of money. And they had these smaller affiliate boutiques around. Um, Tradewinds was one of them. We had up to um, almost up to 40 billion. So it was okay. still pretty good size. It's pretty chunky. Yeah. So and the Asian part was, you know, probably about a quarter of that. OK, cool. So it sounds like you've, you've been around the block, seen many different areas across the investment spectrum. And actually quite interesting as well, is you've been part of the big infrastructure, you've been part of the small infrastructure, and you've kind of like had these ups and downs in your career where you've had quite a few moves and kind of been there, seen it all, done it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, an interesting perspective might be the difference between, or the main differences between that long only infrastructure that you had at the beginning of your career and what you had around you then compared to the smaller funds that you've worked at in the past? What, what are the main differences, you would say? You know, between uh, Franklin Templeton and G Asset, they're both giant firms. Mm. Um, Tradewinds Global is, is pretty big as well. Um, Hedgefund was small. I worked for other couple of firms that I didn't even bring up in between that were also, you know, on the smaller side. So yeah, so I've been kind of working for a bunch of different size firms and traded a bunch of different asset classes. And I think the difference is when you're a giant fund, you're kind of, you have your hands tied quite a bit because of liquidity constraints and opportunities. You know, like if you're trying to trade billions of dollars worth in, a, I don't know, in small cap stock in, in Malaysia or some other country, it can be very, very difficult to get into that position. It might take you months. Mm. Uh, and to get out might take you months. So by default then, the holding periods for these big guys just has to be much longer mm. and there would be you know five seven year holding periods and for a, a smaller fund can be much faster mm. and a smaller fund has more flexibility to yeah. move around in other you know asset classes or maybe smaller companies that uh, bigger guys don't have access to so you know plus that the whole compliance uh, that goes around you know, a big, uh, you know, trading this in a big firm is much more intense. Hmm. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a different, different world. Um, I think I prefer the smaller funds. So it's kind of like <laughs> the, uh, it's kind of like the, uh, the super tanker and the speedboat, right? It's like, how long does it take to turn around a super tanker? A speedboat can just zip around and be in and out, right? And right. I get, it's like the difference investing and trading. I mean, if your time horizon is five, seven years, you're not trading really. Right. It's, I mean, it's, it's investing. It's, you know, and a lot of the trading you do on a trading desk for a big firm is it's basically trading in and out of positions. Hmm. Like, or trading actually, as you say, around positions. Yeah. So you have a big position, you might take some chips off the table, you might add to it. You know, probably, you know, at least half your trades or more are basically trading around current positions. So you have these like core positions that last right. for years. Right. But you're basically overweight, underweight, and neutral in the portfolio relative to other positions yeah that's Tra trading around the core positions yeah because you know to put on a new position for a big firm is actually kind of a big deal I mean it has to get approved by mm. you know the investment board or you know whoever it's like it's a it's a process mm. 
You can't just have a guy who says, oh, gee, I've, you know, I think I'm going to just punt yeah. in this little company in Vietnam. See how it goes. Right. It doesn't work like okay. that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of process. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of hoops to go through before mm. that order actually ends up on the trading desk. Mm. Okay, so the classic uh, way we categorize these types of uh, infrastructures in the market is slow money and fast money, right? Yeah. Um, with the fast money guys, you've obviously seen hedge funds develop over the last 15 years. You've worked for quite a few of them. What changes have you seen with professional traders on the hedge fund side over the last 15 years? What, what's happening now relative to what happened in the past? Yeah, so now, you know, there's definitely um, a direction towards uh, AI and quantitative processes. Yeah. Everything is computer-based. The environment has changed quite a bit in the 15 to 20 years that, that I've seen. Uh, you know, back in the day, the skill set mm. of the investment management team, I, I think, was a lot higher. Mm. Um, because it was a lot more dependent upon the knowledge uh, on the individuals on, you know, at the firm. Now it has kind of progressed more into being, you know, a quantitative um, solution where you can basically just try to put everything in a neat little formula mm. and becoming more and more dependent upon algorithms and computers. Mm. So, you know, Back in the day, I used to get orders from, you know, Mark Lowesco, Mark Mobius, from at Franklin Templeton, you know, basically on a napkin. Mm. And, and, you know, these guys were just unique. Mm. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the old school guys are like that. But now, if you go now to get a job for a hedge fund, um, you know, as a fund manager, a trader, it's, it's all about your computer skills, programming. Mm. That's what it's all about, like your investment knowledge. And, uh, you know, this ability to find opportunities is basically almost non-existent. Now it's all about, you know, how, what, what, how many languages can you program? What are your mm. coding skills? Because mm. we're going to create some, you know, some algos. So what that has done is that it has kind of created like a, a brain drain in a way that the skill set to get into investment management, you know, has, has changed now. So now it's all about the programming. So the, the... Also, the pay scales have been reduced because of this, and yeah. So the so now you know you have a bunch of guys in the hedge fund, and they're not you know necessarily that bright when it comes to finding investment opportunities. But mm. they might be really good at programming, mm. you know, C plus plus, and mm. you know coming up with innovative algos and solutions. Mm. So it has shifted definitely shifted a lot towards um, a different skill set than what used to be required. So in terms of a uh, time horizon, I find that very, very true to be the case on short time horizons, as in the hourly windows, the, the de you know, over a, like a day or two, basically, mm -hmm. or maybe even a week. As you go out across weeks and months, the variables in terms of like quant and programming are so numerous that it's almost, it's almost impossible right. to, for, to have you know, some sort of programming algorithm or AI that can determine outcomes over longer time horizons. And the humans obviously still have a place on the professional side. Outside of that, the investment managers, the humans, are they as talented as they used to be? Well, no, because you can, I mean, you just look at returns now. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, the, you know, the, the, bigger, the bigger firms with the, uh, giant asset sizes mm. you know they by by default need to have a longer time horizon but you know they don't take as the risk that they take is completely different now it's it's skewed now it's all about how they would do versus our benchmark and most of them i, I do way worse than mm. the benchmark mm. so they make they're like all of them basically are classic indexers right you know, that's what they are. They are. It's not about pursuing alpha anymore. Mm. It's about pursuing beta, you know, right. trying to find the, you know, it's all about relative performance. Um, and it's, so, you know, you have a high fee fund um, that can barely keep up with the benchmark. Mm. And, uh, you know, so, so the whole, um, 
the whole the whole game I think has has changed a lot. So it kind of opens up opportunities for retail traders more mm-hmm. because now you know a lot of the knowledge and the education and information is available to retail traders now just as much as professional traders. Okay. So you can actually have you know retail traders that can have a huge advantage over professionals. You know. Because you can move, you can move faster. Uh, you're more flexible. You don't have a giant set of compliance hanging over your shoulders. So let's say that infrastructure is available. It's there for retail traders. Um, assuming that, here's a question. It's probably very important. Do you think retail traders are as good as most human professional traders these days, or can be? Yeah, these days, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, now you can have, you know, if you get the right um, education and, uh, you know, find yourself in a situation where you can get good mentoring, yeah. um, you don't have to have a fancy, you know, degree yeah. to be better than many professional, yeah. many professionals now. But you have to have that, you know, that educational uh, exposure. Otherwise, you're kind of just winging it. Right. So, so yeah, I, I think now it's a great time to be a retail trader. Because you have access to so much information, and you know you actually uh, can be with the right um, mentoring or education, mm. you can be at a huge advantage over professionals. So it sounds like, I think. from what you've pointed out there, it seems like let's say you're a guy coming into the trading and portfolio management industry cold. You're brand new to the industry. It seems like the world is set up now where you do have the quantitative, the systematic, the algo, the AI, and everything is checkbox, 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 checkbox. It's automated, okay? Right. And you also have the human side of the equation where it seems there's time horizon difference between the two because over a long period of time, uh, the, the amount of variables become more qualitative and less quantitative. And retail traders can actually uh, have the ability to make money in financial markets as much as professional traders. How do, what do you think of that definition of the world and how that's set up for somebody coming in to this world? And how do you think they should be approaching things as, mm-hmm. as a person that's literally brand new to the industry? The quantitative world tends to be where the hedge funds are now, mm. and it also tends to lean itself towards very short-term time frames. Mm. But keep in mind that these guys, you know, they'll have a room filled with math programming PhDs. They have so many resources that, you know, for them to come up with this stuff, uh, and it's constantly changing. They'll have maybe a thousand different systems going on at the same time. Mm. Uh, that will be constantly updating because you, you come up with something that you find a little bit of an edge, mm. uh, some type of arbitrage opportunity, or whatever it might be, that doesn't last very long because the competition is so fierce that it, mm. you know, the edge slips away very quickly. You know, unless you have that, those resources, as most of us don't, mm. uh, you know, you're, kind of, you're trying to be David competing against Goliath. Sure. And it's just, you know, it's just not going to work. You okay. need to find your you know, your edge. And on the other side, you know, the, the big guys, the big, most of the big long only funds tends to be the opposite, much more subjective, like I mentioned before, is very much uh, kind of indexing, even though mm-hmm. they say that they are active managers. Well, at the end of the day, they're really more like closet indexers is what it comes down right. to. Um, but as a, you know, there's a world in between where there's great opportunity for investors, you know, traders to come in where, yeah, you need a process or a system, um, but it doesn't have to, you know, be that rigid. Mm. Like if you don't, if you go in, you're trying to, you know, find new opportunities, but you have no process to follow, mm. you're just kind of picking it out of a hat. You're just kind of basically winging it. Yeah. So yeah, you need a systematic process, mm. but not the way you know, a hedge fund would do it, where everything is, gets crunched into, you know, some code with 100,000 lines of code, mm. and it spits out some scalping trades mm. that is typically has to actually be auto-traded yeah. because it's too fast for an individual to actually trade to the point that their desk needs to be really close to the exchange to gain that microsecond over the competition. Yeah. 
and most of us cannot play in that arena mm. and survive, mm. right? So, I mean, you can see it, how the market moves now, especially on a really short-term intraday base, especially like the, you know, the S&P, the NASDAQ, you know, futures market. Uh, most of it is driven by algos, running stops, running levels. Mm. But, you, you know, you need to have your edge and you need to have a process. Mm. So you need to somehow find your process, um, you know, and uh, I think most people who are successful traders have a systematic process that fits their uh, trading style that they follow. But it doesn't mean you have to be tied to it, you know, but it has to be uh, some framework. It seems like a retail trader, as a human, getting an edge has to be systematic. There has to be some sort of quantitative systematic element to it and some discipline there because they have to go right. into a longer time horizon. Where do, where do retail traders, in your opinion, in all probability, get an edge over the market? Well, I think, you know, if you kind of put, this, put yourself somewhere in between the high frequency quant type hedge funds mm. and the plain like long only typical value manager who you know they look at years and years um, so if you look at more I guess what's referred to more as a swing trading style which is uh, you know a few months mm. um, one month to six months around there yeah um, I think you can find a lot of opportunities uh, but I, at the end of the day though you know you really have to mash your personality to your trading style. Mm. You can't necessarily take one approach, and yeah. that's not, it's not going to be a fit all. Sure. You find you have a you know kind of a, a model, if you will, or a, a process, but then you finesse it to to your style. Because mm. if you're not comfortable taking risk, much risk, you shouldn't be trading the same thing as somebody who's very comfortable taking taking risk. Sure. That's kind of a, something that's been really uh, useful for me and something that took me a long time to learn is mm. you're not going to be successful until you matches your trading approach to mm. your personality. Mm. So, I mean, re new, new guys who have literally never done anything in financial markets before, retail traders, mm. open a trading account, put real money in there. It's you know, part of their life savings. And obviously, like anybody else, they don't want to lose it. In terms of gaining a foundation, gaining an education in the first year or two, and then at the same time, obviously, finding where opportunities lie, this kind of like weekly to monthly time horizon, there's, there's so many different styles and so many different ways that can, uh, retail traders can, uh, can approach that kind of like one to six month horizon. So finding the personality within that time horizon, uh, do you think it's possible for retail traders to be successful, like as a high percentage of them? Well, not unless you have basically somebody holding your hand, at least in the beginning, because as soon as you put, you know, real money on the line, um, for a lot of retail traders, it's, it's money that they don't want to lose, right? Sure. I mean, nobody wants to lose, but, sure. but I think... <clears throat> You know, if you trade uh, your own money versus millions of dollars of somebody else's money, when you trade your own money and you lose, and then you think about, oh man, you know, I, I could have used that money for this or that, yeah. uh, it is actually f very difficult sometimes to deal with, especially in the mm. beginning. So mm. discipline is, is to me the most important thing in trading. Mm. Um, but you know, you need you need to have a process, um, and when you start out, you don't know how your trading style is going to fit. Right, with the, with the market. Um, but you need somebody to help you out in the beginning, mm. somebody to hold your hand, because there's so many mistakes that can be made in the beginning. And then the way this works is that you do a couple of mistakes and then it kind of uh, it become a, a snowball where it starts rolling down the hill. And before you know it, you blew out of half your account and you don't really know sure. what happened. You're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. what just happened? And nobody wants to blow half their account, right? <laughs> right, because, and it's all about understanding risk management and discipline. Um, trading is a lot more complicated, really, than what you read in, in any book you can buy. Mm. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's all about emotional how you are emotionally and how you control your emotions. Mm. Um, so if you trade a little, I don't know, some SIM accounts, you might do great, mm. but you don't have the emotional impact, sure. which is huge. 
and uh, you know, especially when you if you when you lose because you will lose on on mm -hmm. multiple trades. You know how you then react to those losses, mm -hmm. and uh, that is I think where it's really important to have somebody you can you can go to for uh, for help and you know somebody can kind of guide you on the right path. But then eventually you build you know develop your own style yeah. and you become self independent. But that you know the learning curve uh, can can take some can take some getting used to, um, and it can be really expensive to get to that point unless you have somebody who can guide you down the right path, I think. So it seems to me like, <clears throat> I mean, retail, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't possible. So retail traders can, you know, in our opinion, and m make a success of themselves starting out, you know, in that kind of like one to three month, one to six month time frame, because there's many, many opportunities there to get some sort of edge over the market. It sounds like, <clears throat> you know, for most guys coming in, it's obviously really, really difficult if they're just sitting in their bedroom and they don't have you know, that guy looking over their shoulder and helping them. So you were in Florida, for example, like uh, just a few weeks ago with a whole bunch of guys right. from the Institute. And it was your inaugural vacation mentoring program. And we had eight retail traders there. How was that experience for you? What did they learn? How were they in terms of uh, response to what they were getting taught. Mm -hmm. what, what type of behaviors did you pick up on from retail traders? It'll be interesting to hear what your experiences were there. Yeah, so, you know, I did a vacation program um, a few weeks ago, and that was really my first exposure to working with retail individuals who are really into, you know, investing and, and mm. trading. And actually, since I started talking to you, what has really blown me away is the, you know, the this kind of the I guess the intelligence of a lot of these retail mm. traders. Mm. Like they they are a lot of them a lot more, you know, advanced actually than some of the professionals are now these days. Mm. You know, they the stuff that they come up with was impressive. Yeah, and it was really interesting. I think was because most of my background has been dealing with other professional traders, you know, you know, sell side guys, buy side guys, whatever. So you kind of uh, all speak the same language. Mm. You know, it's like, uh, I guess, in any profession, you just get used to it. Then when you start talking to other people, what I started to realize was the hunger for people to do it themselves mm. because the returns on for the, you know, on the fun side has just been really bad. Yeah. And it's honestly a pretty low uh, bar, actually, that's mm. set by the institutions these days and uh and man i gotta tell you these guys are, are bright yeah i mean they're not finance guys right yeah they come from all walks of life they have other normal jobs and uh they're really bright they impressed me and uh they're i mean uh, they can probably do just as well or better than many professionals these days i think it's an interesting point actually do you think there's an intellectual snobbery on the professional side that's being caught out in terms of returns yeah it's you know people make a big deal out of oh you know they're this portfolio manager or some fun but mm. you know at the end of the day now we all have access to information mm. you know super fast we have access to probably you know the best and quickest information in history mm. which means that we all more or less in the same playing you know level mm. playing field and as a, as a small investor, you have a, your edge is that you're small. Mm. And that's what I was trying to teach these guys is, you know, you look at the big funds and you're like, oh man, how can I compete against that? Well, you look at where your edge is. Well, first of all, you can invest in smaller companies that a big fund is gonna take months to get into and out of. Mm. And they wouldn't even maybe invest in them at all because, you know, it doesn't fit there. All the boxes aren't necessarily ticked off for compliance and, you know, regulatory reasons and all this other stuff. So the big funds now really have their hands tied behind their back. Mm. I mean, it's really like, you know, I don't know, used to being a race car driver, now you're, you're kind of driving with one hand yeah. behind your back and uh, one patch of the other eye. Yeah. And it's like a huge handicap. So, uh, so now the gap between professional traders and retail traders can really um, merge. But I think, I think what's funny as well is like, <clears throat> when you look at, uh, for example, like, hedge fund managers and how the industry's become so perfectly competitive. 
if, for example, uh, a hedge fund manager, say, at $500 million because they've had a good three to five year track and they're going to want to get over the billion and build more and more infrastructure, their pitch is often a 200 page investment process because that's what investors want to hear. They want to know that yeah. every single detail has been thought of. No stone has left unturned. The investment process is really sophisticated. But then the returns in the hedge fund industry are not justified by the sophistication. And the last thing these guys want to hear is, is uh, well, I can make 15% a year just punting. So give me a billion dollars, right? And this is where, for example, like the retail traders who are smaller, you know, if they can find that niche, for example, where they're, they're, they're not falling for the intellectual snobbery, but they're not punting, there's, there's somewhere in between. Right. The opportunity lies there for them, right? Yeah, I mean, you look back in the day, like when I started, since I didn't have really an investment background, I just consumed all the books yeah. I could read. And some really stuck to me, um, like for instance, like Peter Lynch. Mm. And his approach is completely different than what the guys are now. You know, back then he was, like you said, you know, keeping it simple, you know, hanging out at places, seeing what works, what makes everything tick. Mm. But now that wouldn't fly because what are you going to say? Like, well, you know, I think that, uh, you know, everybody's uh, walking on an iPhone. So, hey, maybe Apple stock is going to go up. That wouldn't sure. fly, you know, yeah, yeah, 10 yeah. years ago unless yeah. you have, you know, some huge booklet of everything and all these super smart, you know, people mm. made all this fancy degree. That's another thing. Now it's more about pedigree. Yeah. And, you know, what looks good on paper. Yeah. Rather than your performance, mm. you know. So a fund would want to have an investment team mm. that they can market as, okay, he's from this school, he's from that school, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have this degree, that degree. That is more important than how has he actually performed. Mm. And it's, it's actually really sad for the investors who invest in the funds at the end yeah. of the day because, you know, they get shafted. Yeah. Why? Just going to have a fancy looking investment team that yeah. everybody's all pretty. So what looks good on paper could end up being toilet paper, essentially. So, yeah. So yeah. now, you know, and as a, as a smaller investor, especially a retail investor, you know, you don't have that hanging over your head. Sure. Right? That you have to impress people with your uh, pedigrees and, and all this stuff. And it's, uh, at the end of the day, if you can make money, you can make money. Sure. And I mean, if somebody can make money, I don't care where they come from. Yeah. It's great, right? Because it's hard. Well, neither does the market. You need the market. The market is very unforgiving. Like either you make or you lose. That's it. Yeah. It doesn't matter like what your background is. Or so now, you know, if you're going to work in industry now, uh, it's kind of sad. But a lot of it is more about pedigree. Yeah. And what school you went to, um, you know, rather than what you actually can do. Sure. Um, so I think, but I think, you know, all this said, I think the the benefit has actually shifted a lot towards the retail investor. Well, this is, uh, I guess, what we brought you in for. So obviously, uh, we hooked up in Los Angeles last year. We hit it off straight away. And I think we're on the same page. Yep. The, um, the need for a retail trader to learn how just to make money and don't you know, get caught up too much in the uh, crazy detail that professional traders can potentially go into right. in the beginning and just get to a point where you understand financial markets and make money. So <clears throat> I think you, know, you coming in is really going to help retail traders in the Institute. This is obviously what you're going to focus on, helping these guys make money and get out of the blocks and get good. So uh, it's been great to meet up in London. Yeah. We've got pretty hectic schedule coming up. We've got a few dinners this week and we've got the super conference on Saturday. And we're going to add, hopefully, a lot of value to retail traders. It's great to have you on board. Yeah, thanks. I think it's, uh, I, I'm excited about it because I, you know, I think I have um, value to add. And, yeah. you know, I see the hunger in these uh, retail guys. To, you know, they want to learn. Yeah. And uh, you can't really just learn this, like, going on Google and trying sure. to, you can learn it. You can learn some stuff there, but not the, not the real deal. Like, you Absolutely. need to be out there. You need to have somebody who's been there, done that. Yeah, been around the block a few times, I think, to, I mean, I think about it, it's like anything. Mm. I mean, you don't want to learn how to be a professional tennis player, you're not going to yeah. Google it, right? Exactly. <laughs> you need a coach. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, I think it's going to be good. Cool, man.
Great to have you on board. Yeah. I'm looking forward to working together soon. Yeah, cool, great. Thank you. Cool.